<laughs> we'll now call the meeting of the Waco City Council on November 5th, 2024 to order at 3.02 p.m. City Council work session. Uh, and welcome to all those in the gallery here today at Bosque Theater at 100 Washington here in downtown Waco. And welcome also to the viewers at home watching on the Waco City Cable Channel. Uh, we will now start the meeting with a moment of silence. Uh, thank you everybody again for being here. Uh, we will start the uh, session with anyone who would like to speak on a work session agenda item. Uh, City Secretary Hicks, do we have anybody today? Uh, seeing no one is registered to speak, we will now recess the regular session and convene into work session with a report from the City Manager, uh, City Manager Ford. Thanks, Mayor. Welcome, Council. Uh, we've got a Great agenda for you this afternoon, and there's no changes between posting and now, so that's good news. I wanted to highlight a couple of uh, recognition items, and it uh, won't surprise the council that each year uh, in November, in, in anticipation of Veterans Day next week, um, we like to honor our city employees that served in the branches of military. And um, so we've got a few of our team members in the back who are veterans. I really appreciate y'all being here. Um, but we have about 170 veterans on our city workforce. Uh, it's more than 10% of our workforce served in some branch of the military. Um, this year, in addition to any comments y'all want to say to our team members that are here or watching, on the video. This year we also had our human resources team and communications team go a little further and create a series of uh, recognition videos to honor the service of these employees. And we've got three videos and before we show those, I just, I think it's important to kind of tie it all together and say why, why is that, why are veterans a great part of our workforce? And it's, it's out of the discipline and care and service for their country that they signed up to serve. And those values carry over really nicely into service of Waco. And I'm consistently impressed with the individuals in our public safety units, in pretty much every other department as well, that bring those characteristics that they learned in the military to Waco and impact our community with it. So. Real proud of each one of those 170 people. Let's show the videos and then um, want to give the council a minute to recognize those that are here with us as well. So Gus, will you roll the footage for me? Hi, I'm Desi Banks. I've been with the Waco Police Department for 21 years, and I served in the Army for six and a half years. Hi, I'm Sarah Raley. I'm an Assistant City Attorney here for the City of Waco, and I was in the Marine Corps for five years. Hi, I'm Officer Sophie Martinez. I have served with the Waco Police Department for over 27 and a half years. I also served in the United States Army as a Staff Sergeant in the Military Police Corps for 11 years. My name is Sean Rowland. I work in Fleet Services for the City of Waco, and I served eight years in the Army as a diesel mechanic. Hi, my name is Gary Hyatt. I'm a commander with Waco Police Department. I've worked for the Police Department since July of 2008. Prior to that, I served in the U.S. Army from 2002 until 2007. I think we've got, I think we've got three total videos. My name is Jeff Kyle. I've been with the department for about four years now. Uh, served eight years in the Marine Corps, four with the infantry, and four with the recon community. Hi, I'm Teresa Bryant. I'm the community outreach coordinator for the City of Waco Public Works Department. I've been with the city for 26 years. 
prior to the city, I was in the United States Air Force. I served for eight years as a ground air radio communication specialist. My name is Brooke Bauer. I work for the City of Waco Police Department for about 30 years now, and I served in the United States Army as an infantryman for about 10 years. Hi, I'm Bill Gowdy. I work as a video production specialist in the city's communications and marketing department. I served 34 years in the Navy, most of that time in combat camera units. I'm Detective Eric Trojanowski. I'm with the Waco Police Department Special Crimes Unit. I've been with the city of Waco for the last 17 years. Before that, I was on active duty in the United States Air Force from 1999 to 2008. I was a C-130 EH navigator and a proud member of the 40th Airlift Squadron Screaming Eagles. I'm Officer Daisy Velasquez. I've been working with Waco PD for the last year. Before this, I was in the Army for seven and a half years, and I served as a combat engineer. Hi, I'm Tammy Honey. I'm a Deputy Court Clerk for the City of Waco Municipal Court, and I served the United States Army nearly three years as an Administrative Specialist. Hi, my name is Kyle Ramsey, and I work with the West Waco Library as a part-time library assistant. I was in the Texas Army National Guard for seven years as a 35 Fox, which is an intelligence analyst. My name is Varel George Jr. I'm a commander here at the Waco Police Department. I've been with the city for 20 years now, and I served four years in the United States Marine Corps. Hi, I'm Samantha Segura. I work as a librarian for the city of Waco at the East Waco Library and I did six years in the United States Air Force at the 11th Intelligence Squadron as a geospatial imagery analyst. Hi, I'm Juan Avila. I've been with the Waco Police Department for uh, 14 years. I currently work as a uh, family violence detective. I was in the Marines for uh, nine years. Council, um, we've got several veterans in the room, and I, I would like them to stand and be acknowledged, uh, and those at the back as well. And that's, it's hard to get veterans to want to get recognized. It's, in, it's embedded in them to serve without an expectation to be served. And so appreciate everybody that got here today, and also the folks on the video, uh, you know, stepping out of their comfort zone a little bit and being recognized. So at this time, if, if, if you're a vet, I see Michael out there. Michael's a vet too, right? Our new airport director. But I would love to have you stand up and be acknowledged. Please uh, feel free to say anything you want, and we've got a little surprise at the end. I want to bring out a, a surprise at the end. Uh, I, I want to, first of all, express our profound gratitude on behalf of the council uh, for all of our city employees who have served um, the, your sacrifice, not only to our nation, but has now continued in your service uh, to our community. So we're so grateful for you, and you continue to serve, and it is profoundly inspirational. So. Uh, thanks to all of you uh, for your continued service to our community after what you've done for our nation. It's, it's just such a, a wonderful aspect to know that we have um, these great uh, citizen veterans here on our team. But I, I'm grateful to uh, Bradley Ford, Ashley Nystrom. Uh, I saw Sarah Rayleigh was uh, featured uh, as well, who uh, assisted our council in setting up the Veterans Advisory Board uh, several years ago. And I think Bradley's gonna talk a little bit about uh, one of the programs, one of the projects that they just accomplished. But I appreciate my fellow council members, our mayor, uh, their support. I know, uh, just like Darius Ewing, I'm, a, I'm an Army brat myself, and uh, I know many of us have uh, military in our family, but uh, this is a profound gratitude from us to you and we're doing our best to help uh, veterans in our communities, both our city staff uh, and out in the community. So thank you all. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Josh. I'll jump in and just uh, 
just echo those comments of, of profound gratitude for the, the service um, of our men and women uh, that we have here at the city and, and, and beyond, uh, that both that work at the city and that, that live in the city of Waco. If you're, you're here in the crowd or, or watching from home, uh, really cannot say thank you enough. Josh touched on this, but both my, my mom and my dad met uh, in the Army. Uh, <clears throat> After they divorced, uh, my mom remarried another uh, army guy, and uh, you know he he went on to do three tours uh, for uh, in Iraq during uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom, uh, and currently my little brother serves as a, a staff sergeant for the Rangers Third Battalion at Fort Moore in Georgia. So. Um, I can confidently say I wouldn't be here uh, where I am today without uh, sacrifice and service uh, of our service members. Um, so thank you so, so much uh, for the work that you have done and continue to do um, in and for our city. I'll just say that we, we don't thank you enough because we can't thank you enough. So, uh, but I'm glad that we have this opportunity here today and from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Thank you all for everything that you've done for our country and for, that you do for our city. They say service is the price we pay for the air that we breathe, and we have to really, really recognize that our real freedoms, they come because of choices, and those choices are ones that you all made. You made them to protect our country, to serve our country, and to uphold the values of our country, and we thank you for keeping our country and our, our values free. Uh, thank you. Uh, all the council members, are, what they have said, I feel as well. Uh, my daddy had nine brothers, and out of the nine brothers, seven of them all were in the service, and one Air Force, Marines, uh, Army. And uh, so I wasn't an Army brat or anything like that, but my family <laughs> were all deeply involved. <laughs> <laughs> I have been called worse. <laughs> but anyway, I want to thank our veterans that are in the city service. We can't thank you enough for being in the service, taking care of our country, and now you're in the Waco team taking care of our residents and citizens. So uh, I want to thank you from, again, I'm not an Army brat, but I want to thank you from District 2, yeah. For your service and your continued service as well so thank you so much yeah thanks i'll echo all the council members up here today thank you for your service um you know you voluntarily put your lives on the line uh for our uh, freedoms uh, we wouldn't be here today in this little city council thing if it wasn't for you guys they wouldn't be holding a national election today if it wasn't for you guys and uh just uh Super proud of uh, you all, and super proud that, that you're a part of the, the City Waco team. We're, we're, we're proud of you here on, on council. I'm proud of you as mayor. Um, it was it, The presentation was neat because we got to see what you do uh, at the city and then what you did in the service. And I'll agree with Bradley, of uh, our city manager, Ford, in that y'all are so assum unassuming and modest of your of your uh, uh, military service. I'm, I'm just so super impressed that uh, we've got this kind of uh, veteran leadership, uh, both in the, at the nation uh, and, our, and our state and, uh, and on our uh, City of Waco team. So I appreciate you guys being here today and, and thank you for your service. Thanks, Council, for your comments. And it's, um, you know, there's the Council a lot of times for the folks that are in the room from staff uh, that, that aren't in these meetings often. They, they get to say a lot of nice things to people. But when you listen to the words they just shared and you hear their voices kind of cracking and you hear that emotion, you know it's really heartfelt. And um, so I appreciate each one of you for caring about these individuals. I also want to, uh, I got a little surprise. Josh, if you don't mind, uh, would like you to help unveil that special initiative you mentioned that's uh, coming out of our Veterans Advisory Board we worked with Veterans One Shop, One Stop Shop, and City Center Waco to uh, start a new program, a community recognition project that'll go uh, live uh, at the end of this week. We'll have banners along Austin Avenue, which is our Veterans Parade route, that honor local veterans. Um, and so, real proud of Josh's work, Councilmember Borders' work, as well as uh, several members of the staff that that made this happen 
and uh, we'll, we'll keep those banners up for the better part of November. And uh, you want to unveil what those look like, Josh? Yeah. Yeah, very good. <laughs> This is year one of that program, and so if you've got somebody in your family that served, um, we'll be looking for hearing their story and getting more banners out there next year to honor those stories, and that I think it'll be a, a really neat way for people to walk down Austin Avenue and say, that's my grandpa, or that's my dad, or that's my mom, and I'm proud of her, and I'm going to take my picture under her banner, and so I think it's a neat way to honor the service and uh, looking forward to seeing those out later this week. Uh, next up. It's awesome, uh, Bradley. Oh. It's awesome that you and your staff have come up with this recognition of our veterans. I think that's awesome, truly awesome. Thanks, Council Member. I think it's going to be, I do think it's going to be neat um, as well. We, uh, we do have another. Uh, PSA, I think I'm supposed to highlight a public service announcement coming out of the comms and marketing team. Um, it's the kind of the latest and greatest PSA. It highlights our Lost Pets Waco map and feature, and it's going to, there's going to be some friendly faces that you recognize in this one. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I like the Such a downgrade <laughs> from the last three videos here. <laughs> it's a nod to Men in Black, as you can tell. <laughs> Uh, and, in the middle. and the dogs, <laughs> the one in the middle is the best looking for sure. The dogs that we uh, that we feature are all rescue animals out of the shelter. Um, so, and then of course we got you know the two guys here that will will be prominent featured. Why don't we roll that gust for them? Well, you really did it this time, Slick. How did you lose Frank again? Look, do you know how hard it is to keep tabs on a Romulian? <laughs> and so you're back from outer space. I just walked in to find you here with that sad look upon your face. Should have changed that stupid block. Should have made you leave your key. If I'd known. Frank! Uh oh. Get your head back in the car. Look, man, we've got to get you microchipped. We've been putting this off for way too long. Ah, my bad. <laughs> Besides, we didn't lose him. We just don't know where he is. Wouldn't have happened if he was microchipped. Just saying. He's a tiny pug with a big mouth. How far could he have gone? You worry too much. You know the difference between you and me? What's that? I make this look good. <laughs> <laughs> I like that walk, guys. <laughs> Excuse me. Y'all seen this pug? He's about gay high, big attitude, thinks he's funny. Is this a joke? Trust me, we wish it was. You guys seen this dog? We've been looking all night. It's a pug, big attitude. No. Wait, have you guys tried LostPetsWaco.com? Lost Pets Waco features a real-time map of where stray animals were picked up in the field by animal control. Search the entire list, or search by location. Just click on the map. Check here first for your lost pet. Most pets are picked up within one mile of their homes. Wait, aren't you the man? Nope, I'm just a figment of your imagination. <laughs> are, we, are we wrong? Are we live? All right. Well, you really did it this time, Slick. 
How did you lose, Frank? Again? Look, do you know how hard it is to keep tabs on a remote in? Sorry, we had a helicopter fly around. Uh, you worry too much. I shouldn't make the last one. I can keep straight face on set. That's a different. I can't look at it. You, you believe that part? No, no, no. <laughs> that I guess uh, everybody's heard by now that Darius and I won the uh, best acting by a buddy cop duo <laughs> in, uh, in a local cable channel PSA. <laughs> and I want to thank the Academy. I want to thank my drama coach, Josh Borderud. I want to thank my wardrobe director who for not asking, taking me out of my black suit safe zone. You know? So anyway, a lot of fun shooting this thing and I appreciate uh, uh, Dory Helm and uh, uh, the, the others that worked on this uh, th this project, uh, and uh, really uh, the lead actor in this deal was Darius. I mean, he mm. was flawless. We were out there for what three hours shooting this thing. Luckily, we got uh, thirty seconds of good film there. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's always fun doing these. And most importantly, the purpose of it is to is for the uh, animal shelter and uh, taking care of your pups, making sure they're uh, chipped and neutered and spayed. So let's uh, and I appreciate. See Ashley Nystrom over there in the corner. Uh, her leadership out out at the pet circle and uh, Melissa Sheldon out there too. This is all to kind of get some momentum going at the at the pet circle. So yep. my co-star or my uh, my my <coughs> leading actor. I'm the supporting actor yeah, in this wow. thing. But. Uh, thanks to Sheila Hilliard, my sixth grade theater arts teacher, um, for teaching me uh, how to be a good scene partner. Um, no, I, I, I agree. Uh, th th we spend a lot of time out there and, and we have a really phenomenal team that, that put uh, this video together and um, I felt this way when, when Josh was Abe Lincoln in the library. You, you spend time doing it and you, there's no, you're like, I don't know how this is going to turn out and then you see it and it's like, this is incredible. Um, obviously there was more green screen in this, but um, yeah, I, we, they, they are, we have so many talented people that work here at the city of Waco. Um, from the folks that put the video together to the folks that work at Pet Circle, that uh, who the video is there to benefit. So, um, yeah, g go ahead and get your pets microchipped, guys. Uh, my wife and I have taken probably six or seven dogs in the last few years to the nearest fire station, Fire Station Eight on Cobbs, uh, to get them checked, and probably two out of the eight have been microchipped. Uh, we've successfully reunited two, which is nice. Um, but uh, wish we could have been eight for eight on that. Um, and I'm sure the strain on our city's uh, resources in terms of, of operating the shelter would also appreciate uh, a successful uh, reunification of pet and owner. So get your pets microchipped. And if you find a pet and you're not sure, take them to the nearest fire station and they will check them for you. Great. I would encourage everybody to go out to the Lost Pets Waco uh, website. The map that shows the, look, the, the animals that are in our care um, has been completely redone to run faster and to be more informative. And so appreciate IT helping with that. Um, and right, the goal is, I mean, obvious to generate some, some laughs and some awareness around the lost pet issue. Because the less time that we can have them in our care at the shelter, the better, since we're still right at 100% capacity heading into the spring season when we know we're gonna be getting a lot more animals. And so adopt, don't shop, but also get your pets chipped and use the resource that's at, over at Lost Pets Waco. And, and special thanks, thank you guys for having a sense of humor and being willing to, to lead out in that way. Um, um, yeah, I just, I just clearly y'all enjoyed it. There was a, perhaps a mis, mis 
misstep in the awarding of the best actor in the 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 best in the video was the dog. <laughs> He was Where's so Frank's cute. accolades? Okay, <laughs> <laughs> and the narrator, of course. But no, it's great. Um, uh, this is also as we're leaning into the holiday season. It's a great time for folks to consider those Christmas gifts that could come from Pet Circle because it's nothing better than a live animal on Christmas morning. <laughs> Noted that you think that. <laughs> That's right. You're gonna have a bunch of animals on your uh, doorstep. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> Tell them, but I won't. But we're thinking about we're thinking about it. So yeah, it's all good. Um, Mayor and Council, we do have one informal report on the agenda today. It's IR 872. It provides a, an update on progress made out of the four task groups from the strategic housing plan that was presented to Council in 2022. Galen Price uh, is here to answer any questions you may have on that. Um, as part of that plan that was adopted, we've, we made a commitment to the community and to, to you as a council to continuously update you of progress being made. And so that's what the IR is, is doing. Um, we do have 31 resolutions on the agenda. Um, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yep. I do appreciate the update, Galen. I saw him somewhere. There he is. Um, um, I am curious, like, uh, for the things that are in progress that we talked about, like um, the community land trust and the the housing trust fund, um, are is there a, a anticipated timeline? I know there have been some some ongoing things that were happening through and and pieces of the puzzle that don't involve you all that are bigger than that. But um, I was hoping to see if there you know where we were going with that because I wanted to. I mean, is it a year thing is it an 18 months thing 24 you know just just some directive of of where we're going with that and the, especially the um uh rental registration ordinance well good afternoon mayor and council Hi. to answer your question yes um, we are looking at um, exploring different options from other cities um, and once we have compiled that uh, we do look to kind of put together to see what works best for Waco um, and, and bring that forth. Now, from a timing perspective, um, it's really difficult to, to give an actual um, hard deadline. Mm -hmm. But I will say that, you know, within the next 12 months, um, definitely we will be looking to um, to bring something forward, if not sooner than that. Because I know some of the things, you know, were were particular time to windows, you know, and as we continue to do the ADA stuff and the work, the great work that has happened with TSTC and, you know, when we're talking about all the things that we've done in lead abatement and, and housing rehabilitation, which has been very strong and I applaud staff for leaning into that and helping our residents better their environments in a way that they can um, do it with dignity. I, I'm great, great, greatly appreciative of that part, but I know that as we lean into these seasons and economic challenges and upheavals, there's still some things that I think we can do as a city, and they've already been identified, so that's the easy part, is identifying the what, and I think it's just the how and the when that I would like to keep a continual uh, eye on because it's not something that's going to go away. Um, and I think that with the number of people, while we lean to you know, the American dream of home ownership, there are a bunch of people in the world that rent, but they, they don't have protections that they should. So I think that, that those are some things that we should really, really be considering and looking into. Um, I do appreciate all that the city has done with our vacant properties um, to align a more strategic plan. I know that from the day I sat here, I was like, what are we doing and why are we doing it? And can we do it with some more intentionality? And we have. And so I appreciate staff for that. Um, but I'm, I want to see, I want to see us get this through. And so in a way that we can be proud of, of the opportunities, uh, that we, that we create for our residences regarding their housing and, and, and housing protections. Thank you. Yeah, again, while you're down there, I'll just, yeah, it's a great report. Uh, I like how you outlined it, vacancy, density, uh, neighborhood revitalization, and looking at that housing trust, the, evaluating the possibility of that. But in the status report, I encourage folks to look at that, pages 13 through 15. 
Uh, we're super proactive. I mean, this council understands the the housing challenges here in the city, and we're proactive about trying to figure out a way to solve that. And appreciate your work, Galen. Thank you. And he got he got the memo. Maybe you should be with them on Men in Black. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, thanks, Galen, for thank you for a brief update there. We um, we do have 31 resolutions on the agenda today. I'm going to highlight two of them. The first is Resolution 882. I just want to make sure there's clarity on uh, from the public standpoint of what we're doing over at Pet Circle. Um, we are acquiring additional properties around the current properties we own. Oh yeah, thanks for the map. We're acquiring everything in red along 23rd street and circle road um, the item before you is seeking it has a recommendation to spend um, a little over nine hundred thousand dollars to acquire those properties and allows us to ensure our long-term viability at this location it gives us room to grow it also gives us room to shift uh, buildings around as needed as well as provide for future opportunities that we're currently not doing um, so excited to bring this forward and just want to make sure folks knew with these acquisitions we're we're in a really good position to be at that location for a really long time and serve the animal community very well the other highlight I had was resolution 889 uh, and I think there's a map on this one too hopefully it approves the purchase of wire wireless access points uh, a Cisco switch firewall solar poles and cameras, uh, installation network cabling, and fiber optic cabling, um, all to, de to deploy or to support the deployment of a mesh Wi-Fi network at the future steam center on the river and Martin Luther King Drive Boulevard, as well as the Bridge Street Plaza. Those are the two images you're seeing on the top there. Those, the coloring or shading indicates the quality of network that we present once we make these installations green is of course really good yellow is pretty good um, these this will be a significant um, amenity for both the steam center and east waco giving essential internet access into these locations both for visitors that are in buildings but also visitors that are just wanting to hang out and enjoy the public spaces that have been created <coughs> Uh, we're funding this out of, uh, this is about a $400,000 project, we're funding it out of our American Rescue Plan allocations. Galen will be speaking to that here in a few minutes in the work session, and also our federal support from uh, CDBG. And so leveraging both those assets to bring a really, really important, um, you know, resource into this location, expanding digital access, uh, promoting equity and, and really driving people into spaces that that we want to be in so excited for the team that put this together we do have uh, four ordinances on the agenda all of them are on second reading so Kathleen's gonna get ready to read a whole lot <laughs> um, and that concludes my report today and I'll take any questions or comments from the council Brad I did have a couple of comments on the resolutions just hi highlights more than anything else um, number 883 and 884, uh, those are both related to the new river walk that we're about ready to, I think we've got the bids out right now and we should get started on that uh, early next year. It's about a 20 month project. But those, uh, the two on the agenda or the, the resolution agenda today are about the lighting and the water elements and the waterfall elements are gonna go into that's gonna be from uh, the law school all the way to Webster, I believe. And it's, it's gonna look fantastic. Another great welcome to Waco signature uh, area there um, also eight seven eight ninety seven and eight ninety eight um, we talk a lot about the streets that we're working on and it's a big giant part of our budget every year and a giant part of our prioritization but these are a couple of sidewalks that uh, pretty good size and one's out in Ritchie Road a quarter mile of, of length out there and another one is on Jefferson Street about a mile on Jefferson Street that we're talking about going from St. Francis all the way up to uh, get the cross street 13th I believe um, two and a half million dollars of sidewalk uh, repair and, and uh, a lot of federal funding in there too so we're taking advantage I like this in so many ways because we're working on the sidewalks we're getting we're we're leveraging our city dollars with federal funds uh, uh, so we're, we're very conscious of multimodal uh, 
issues here in the city. In the last, just 906, 907, and, and 909, big projects, uh, $10 million projects with water lines to the industrial park, uh, utility lines on I-35, and uh, wastewater lines on what we call the North Interceptor Project, uh, just getting the infrastructure in place for the city and, and, and trying to be wise with spending taxpayer uh, funding. So, good work. Uh, Riley, I want to say, just follow up on, uh, as I was reading those reports, I was so excited and happy to see Sandtown Plaza. Thank you, staff. Thank you for that. It's exciting. And I really appreciate the, uh, the, the good work with the Wi-Fi, both at the Future Steam Center there in Doris Miller, um, but also at, uh, at Bridge Street, which, and I don't want to steal any District 1 thunder there, but I do appreciate that our kind of public spaces have this Wi-Fi. And I, I'm sure vendors and attendees at the farmer's market in addition to all the wonderful activity Absolutely. that's going to be going on in the STEAM, but I, I, I assume they will really appreciate having that strength of signal out there. So appreciate Absolutely. the good work staff's doing over there to further operationalize the, the Bridge Street Plaza. Yeah, it's really, it will, really appreciate IT. It will certainly the, make their, their processes easier, um, knowing that they have good, strong, dedicated signal and all that. Um, it, that also kind of helps us advance with some work that we've been working on for a while, you know, becoming a smarter city, having uh, localized fiber optics and Wi-Fi available in our public spaces. We've done that strategically. I want to thank the IT team for that over since COVID and uh, plus, um, you know, enhancing the area around the Dewey and North Waco, enhancing the area around um, Miller in East Waco. And, uh, and the things will continue because that, that makes sense for us to do it in that way. So I'm appreciative of those steps that are going. Also, real quick, 894 and 895, I don't want to sleep on the updates that have happened to the municipal court um, in both security yeah. and technology. That is something that, I mean, you know, you, 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 don't, you, don't, you may not deal with the municipal court unless you got to deal with the municipal court. But uh, what we want to do is make sure that the things that, that need to happen in that court can happen and that will happen with updated security measures and updated tech, technology measures. And so I'm thankful that we had um, the resources in that way and some of the way they have restructured fees and how they do their technology fee to pay for itself. Um, so that is good management. And I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to see that those advances are happening. Uh, Council member, thank you for reminding me about, I, I was thinking I wanted to talk about the municipal court mm -hmm. that's being done, all the work that's being done and new work being done there. Uh, it's been a long awaited time for our municipal court judge, Ms. Uh, Judge Garcia. Uh, thank you for reminding me about all that and thanks staff uh, for bringing this forward at this time, at this particular time and uh, I had to go to the municipal court, not for me, but I went with my grandson uh, to pay his ticket. He wanted me to accompany him. <laughs> so I went, so I got to see firsthand all the problems that he had at that particular time and how long it took for people just to go and make a payment on their ticket. So what's, what we're proving today is really gonna help our folks, our citizens of going in there, new security cameras, new this, new that, new laptops, uh, and drop boxes and vaults and everything that he, he has needed in that court. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad we're doing that for, not just for the judge, but for our, our residents and constituents that go and use and have to go to the municipal court. So now it's going to be a friendlier, nicer place. So thank you, thank you, staff, for that. Thanks, council members. I um, it's fun hanging out with y'all, but we need to take a five-minute break. Okay. We have a a slight issue with our interpreters. Okay. And we have a request for interpretation from a resident, and we want to get the interpretation issue resolved so they can participate in the meeting with us. So let's take five minutes. We'll get, Michelle's working on it, but we'll, we'll get it solved and then we'll come back together.
Sorry. A five minute break here. Yeah, the soft yes. We're, we're limping along on some streaming problems, but I but appreciate City Secretary for, for doing what she can to get us resolved. Uh, did we have anything else on the business session review? Sir. Okay, then we will next move to the consent agenda. That consent agenda includes resolutions 2024-878 through resolution 2024-908. Are there any items the council would like to remove from the consent agenda? We are pulling uh, 878. That is the uh, first one, uh, which uh, references the McCad election. We're gonna do that one separately tonight. So the consent agenda includes resolutions uh, 2024-879 through resolution 908, except for the 878. Um, the next item on the agenda is work session items 2024-873 through 2024-875. City Manager Ford, will you please introduce the first work session? We've got uh, Galen Price joining us here at the table uh, to provide a, an update for the council and community on the federal funding that we've received through the American Rescue Plan Act and also local fiscal recovery funds. This update um, is gonna talk about the eligible, eligible uses of the funds as well as the timeline and the projects that and buckets that the council is obligated money to. Um, I really appreciate Galen uh, taking on the ARPA initiative for us. It's been a little bit like herding cats and that cats are not our department heads, but rather the cats are me. And so he's shown a, a great deal of flexibility as we've worked through a, a very new program and uh, but a very important one. So I look forward to his update today, Galen. All right. Thank you, Bradley. Uh, good afternoon again, Mayor and Council. Um, as Brid Bradley mentioned, we'll be covering, uh, discussing the eligible use of funds, giving an overview of our city funding plan, talking about our expenses to date, and providing a project status update. So to refresh Council's memory about the eligible uses, the initial eligible, eligible uses included um, lost public sector revenue, um, Addressing the negative impacts of the pandemic through economic and public health issues, as well as investing in infrastructure, including water, sewer, and broadband. In August of 2023, um, Treasury provided additional eligible uses for the ARPA funding, which include emergency relief for natural disasters, um, to support service transportation projects, and to support Title I projects, which are projects uh, and activities eligible under the Community Development Block Grant, or CDBG. So the city's funding plan was established in October of 2021 through, in, uh, through uh, feedback from the community as well as from the council. Now I want to remind you of our commitment and expenditure deadlines with the commitment deadline of these funds being December 31st of 2024, and the expenditure deadline for these funds, December 31st of 2026. Now, based on that information, uh, we will be looking to propose additional changes to our plan, given needs that have been identified and the time-sensitive nature of the funding. So here you'll see a chart which shows our current amount, as well as some of the proposed adjustments and the adjustments occurring between the categories of responding to the public health and economic impacts, as well as the disaster relief. Here is a pie chart that shows um, the current funding allocations for the projects. And then the next slide shows the proposed allocation, um, the changes that are made, which there's a slight change between housing and the resiliency projects that have been funded. Here's a chart that shows our expenditures to date, which uh, those proposed reallocations, those amendments will be forthcoming at our next council meeting um, for your approval.
here you have a map that shows, a heat map that shows kind of where all the ARPA funds have been invested. So as you can see from the map, um, the primary investment of these funds have been within the city's core. Now, up into our project status updates. So to date, we've completed programs such as the MCC job training, of course, the We All Win Small Business Grant Program, um, creative, creative Waco Artist Support, and recently in June, the Waco Family Medicine Project was completed. So here are pictures of the newly renovated Waco Family Medicine. projects that are ongoing, we have several projects that will be coming forth um, either on this agenda or uh, future agendas, um, including funding for the resiliency, which is the community center and utility generators, um, the STEAM center, which the RFP has been closed. And so now we're, we'll be bringing forth um, soon a uh, resolution for that agreement. Um, just wanted to highlight, we did receive an additional $3.5 million um, in community project funding award, which was one of the federal appropriations that we received for FY24. And then as mentioned earlier, um, there is an item regarding the broadband on tonight's agenda um, for your approval. Additional projects include the Page Estates, um, as well as the Sanger development, um, which also received a community project funding award. Um, then in regards to our housing bridge, um, we're proposing to reallocate funding from the Salvation Army, uh, and this money will be reallocated to the Salvation Army from a different federal source, given the time-sensitive <coughs> nature of our ARPA fund. Here's an update regarding the Creekside Village. Uh, as you can see, they've raised over half of the um, funding needed for the phase one. Um, they've received their construction permit. Um, they've begun the grading work and they're working on a water and sewer access plan. And here is a video showing um, kind of what the site looks like at this point in time. Looks ready for construction. <laughs> that concludes my update and I'll answer any questions that you may have. Any questions for staff on this, guys? Excited about the way uh, staff has been both substantively and creatively uh, deploying these funds for our uh, strategic purposes. Thank you, Galen, for all the good work you've done through these last several years uh, with this funding. We appreciate you. I'll say that and just say that um, I, I can't imagine it's been easy since COVID um, as, as the federal government has uh, all of their mandates to distribute all of this funding and, and, and you know, we, we put out for it and, and find the best use for it once it gets to our community. So I appreciate you being kind of the, the, the filter there to uh, both uh, seek these funds and then, and then find the best use, uh, you know, find the, the square peg for the square hole as, as we receive them. Uh, because there are plenty of things that um, throughout my, my time on council that, that I would have never thought you know, uh, American Rescue Relief Plan funds uh, or CDBG funds could be used for, but uh, you and your team have been really uh, thoughtful and creative in, in finding the, the best community use uh, for these funds and, and acting on that. So I appreciate that and thanks for this update. Yeah, I'll, I'll say and echo my council members here that I really want to commend staff uh, and Deputy City Manager Emerson. I know you kind of led this charge too, as, as well as uh, uh, Director uh, Price. Um, because yeah, when we get this, anytime you get federal program money, it's like you got to figure out the hooks in it and where you have to spend it, and it's not easy. It's not. It's not just uh, 
you read it and that's very clear where you put it. As my fellow council members have said, it's got to precisely fit the program and you got to thread the needle with some of these uh, to make them fit. Uh, and if you look at the information on page uh, 28, I mean, this is a nice summary of, of, of what we did. And you and you'd already gone over the director price, but just highlighting it again, you know, practical things like utility generators. Yeah, we need to get those. You made that fit the program. Uh, the Creekside Village, which we're going to hear more about uh, from John here today, but uh, that fit the program. Uh, small business, just the, 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 you figured out a way to make it fit the small business, three and a half million dollars there, which is amazing. Um, the Waco Family Medicine uh, expansion, the, uh, and what I liked, the, the, the police salaries, we figured out a way to fund the police salaries out of this too. And the crown jewel is the SEAM Center that we're all very excited about. So I appreciate staff working on this to fit uh, this $35 million of federal money into true needs of the uh, of the city and, and not, and other things that we were thinking about, these are like one-time deals. We're not creating future obligations for the taxpayers. These are coming in one-time deals from the federal government. So uh, appreciate the work on it and nice update. I love, I love the format. Thanks, Galen. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Galen, uh, City Manager Ford, will you introduce the next yeah. speaker? Our next one, uh, you kind of did a good job segueing, talking yeah. about federal requirements, and but we've got a really, uh, a really large new grant coming forward. Go ahead, team, come on up to the table. That uh, This next work session is going to discuss the uh, United States EPA Environmental Climate Justice Community Change Grant Award to Mission Waco and and its statutory partner, the City of Waco. We're inviting to the table Eric Kaufman, who's on the city team. He's our sustainable programs manager. Um, he's joined by uh, someone that's not a stranger to y'all, John Calloway, who's running uh, executive director for Mission Waco, Mission World, as well as Emily Hills, who's director of the Urban REAP. This group, as well as a few other supporting cast members, wrote a, a very compelling federal grant application that's been awarded almost $18 million from the EPA into the Waco, Waco market. And Mission Waco is going to serve as the lead applicant. We're happy to be in support. And so the team's going to describe the various uses for this $18 million and talk about the, the roles and responsibilities of what we're trying to accomplish. And so I'm excited to hear, I think Eric's going to kick us off. Is that correct? Yep. I'm excited to hear from the team and, and just a special thanks for y'all's efforts as well as the other team members. I see LaShonda here and there, I know there's several other team members that supported this initiative and i um, very thankful for all the work y'all put in to bring us probably what will end up being our largest grant award of the year into the Waco market. So Eric, why don't you take us away? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor and Council, for this opportunity to... Uh, talk about this exciting grant. It's kind of the culmination of uh, obviously a lot of hard work from a lot of people, um, kind of a culmination of, uh, I feel like the, uh, I've been with the city for about three years and uh, I feel like we've really been working on a lot of things that kind of led up to this. So um, I will uh, go over some background and details about the grant. We'll talk about our collaborators, uh, and then get into the work plan and some of the deliverables. So a little bit about the background. This actually began, um, we, we got a grant in 2023 called Partners for Places. A group of us um, got this grant from the Funders Network. And uh, the, the purpose of this grant was really um, at the intersection of environmental sustainability and environmental justice work. And this, this grant required a partnership across, uh, it, it involves a city sustainability office, CBOs, which are um, local community-based organizations or nonprofits, and a local funder. And uh, uh, Cooper Foundation was gracious enough to provide the matching funds that we needed for this grant. Um, and it was a total of $300,000 that we got uh, over the course of a year. Um, to run a program, um, we ended up calling our, our group the SCRAP Collective, SCRAP being an acronym for Sustainable Community and Regenerative Agriculture Project. And um, with the SCRAP Collective, with all of our partners, we managed to divert 123,000 pounds of food waste 
um, that we kept out of our landfill. We engaged over 4,000 community members uh, through more than 100 events. And the Scrap Collective partners were Mission Waco, World Hunger Relief, Global Revive, Family of Faith Worship Center, DeShack Farmers Market, Baylor University, and the City of Waco. Um, I did want to mention um, one of the requirements of the grant was to have someone uh, who is considered the equity facilitator um, for the group of partners. And so we found a wonderful woman uh, um, from Baylor University, Dr. Stephanie Boddy, who was our equity facilitator. Um, she's not able to be here today, but um, the reason is she is in Cairo, Egypt mm -hmm. today. And uh, she is actually at a UN conference. And in fact, she is speaking about the Scrap Collective to global leaders right now. So it's, it's pretty exciting for us to, uh, to really see <laughs> Oh, what's, what's happened with the Scrap Collective. And, and I'll mention Dr. Josh King, uh, another professor at Baylor University who's also there. Um, so that's, that's pretty exciting. And, and so, you know, we were really excited, this group, um, as we worked together and we, we had so much success on this project and we really wanted to continue the work and find some additional funding. We looked around at, at different <coughs> opportunities and um, especially the federal grants that were out there. Um, and so we came across the EPA Community Change Grant, which was a grant that really fit uh, a, a similar goal um, to what we had been doing in terms of that intersection between environmental sustainability and environmental justice work. And so um, we were fortunate, so the, the Funders Network, who um, uh, provided the Partners for Places grant, they uh, were really happy with the work that we did with their <coughs> Partners for Places grant, and so they, in fact, offered us some additional grant money specifically to work on a federal grant to get some more money to continue our work. So with that additional funding, we actually reached out to an organization called HARC, uh, which stands for the Houston Advanced Research Center. And um, this organization, uh, I became familiar with them through uh, my work on the Solar for All grant, and I recognized that this was an organization that had a lot of capacity, uh, a lot of ability to um, write and uh, write successful grants and also administer large federal grants. And so we invited them to come here to Waco uh, to help facilitate an all day workshop. And we brought all the partners together um, to work on the grant application. So a little, little bit about the grant itself. I'll just read um, this overview uh, quote to support comprehensive community and place-based approaches to redressing environmental and climate injustices for communities facing legacy pollution, climate change, and persistent disinvestment. These concentrated local investments will fund community-driven, change-making projects that center collaborative efforts for healthier, safer, and more prosperous communities. So, uh, one of the requirements in the application was it needed to be a partnership. Um, they called it a statutory partnership. And so uh, Mission w Waco is the lead on this grant, um, but they needed a partner and the city of Waco um, fulfilled that statutory partnership requirement. Um, it also required an application of between 10 and $20 million. And we realized uh, with the Scrap Collective that we probably wouldn't be able to have the capacity to spend $10 million over the, the three-year requirement of the grant. So we knew that we had to expand this to include a lot of other projects as well. And in fact, the grant uh, encouraged multiple projects. Um, so we have a, no a number of partners on this, um, other subrecipients um, that are part of this grant. Um, the, uh, the applications are actually still open. The, the, they're evaluating the applications on a rolling basis and the deadline, the final deadline is November 21st. But we were notified about a month ago um, that we were awarded this grant. And, uh, and so um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of the requirements. There, there are a couple major requirements. Um, requirement one involved climate action strategy. So the grant had a laundry list of strategies that we could um, we could pick and choose from in terms of what, what we wanted to focus um, our work on. And I've listed five here. 
Um, these are the strategies that we specifically called out in our grant application um, for requirement two, for requirement one, and then requirement two um, was related to pollution reduction strategies. And so we had three strategies that we called out in the grant um, that, that we'll be working on. So I did want to mention, um, obviously, you know, my work at the city is very focused on um, particularly supporting the uh, environmental sustainability of our community. And this grant certainly, um, you know, is, is satisfies that strategic goal uh, for the, the city council. But I, I definitely want to point out that this grant um, really fulfills a number of strategic goals. And I, I'd say especially on the resiliency, provide a safe and resilient city, um, and also equity, create a culture of equity and inclusion. That's a real big focus um, of this grant. So our application was for um, almost $17.9 million, and we were told that we would be awarded the full amount. Um, we're currently negotiating with EPA right now uh, to begin the grant period January 1st of 2025. And again, that grant period will be for three years, so we'll have to spend the money by the end of 2027. Um, the, uh, as I mentioned, Mission Waco is the lead applicant on this grant, so they will be receiving the full award. Um, they will be utilizing about $7 million of that for their projects. The city of Waco will utilize about $2.2 .2 million um, through housing and uh, almost a million through the health district. Uh, HARC is going to be doing a significant amount of program administration for this grant. And in fact, uh, the funding will for the subrecipients will uh, come through HARC. So in fact, the city of Waco will be getting their funds through HARC, uh, as well as World Hunger Relief, Family of Faith Worship Center, and um, finally Baylor University. I did also want to mention we, um, you know, we have a number of other partners that were involved in the Scrap Collective. Um, those partners will be uh, working on this grant as well. They will be part of the projects that we're working on, even though they weren't specifically written in um, as subrecipients, but they are definitely included in the work we're doing. So just quickly, um, going through our work plan, uh, the housing department will have funding to um, do some more work on lead abatement. So both the, um, the lead paint issues uh, in, in a lot of our housing, as well as um, uh, lead pipes in the water lines. The public health district uh, was not part of the original Scrap Collective, but they are going to be playing a, a pretty significant role with us through this grant. They're going to be um, doing a lot with the partners in the Scrap Collective. They also do a lot of work with local schools, and so they will um, expand what we're doing with the Scrap Collective uh, within the schools in ter terms of educating folks about um, food waste diversion and composting, community gardens, healthy eating and cooking, um, they'll also have a, um, a tree program that they'll be able to provide some native trees and education in that area with the community, um, as well as um, working with uh, some local businesses, restaurants, um, to be using more compostable containers um, in their businesses. So I'm going to turn it over now uh, to John and Emily to talk about what Mission Waco is doing. Yeah, Mayor, Council Members, thanks for having us today. Uh, first, want to acknowledge Mr. Kaufman's efforts to make this happen. This is a significant grant for all of these sm our small nonprofit friends, including us. It's a huge deal for us. Um, also, I want to thank our partners for helping out. Uh, it's not possible without Mr. Kaufman's work uh, and them as well. I also want to highlight how much of a unique opportunity and partnership this is for Mission Waco and the city. I think historically it's been the nonprofits coming to the city to beg for money, uh, and now we get to return the favor a little bit. <laughs> so you're welcome. Um, but I think this is a really true partnership where we're linking arms, coming together, sharing resources, and this may sound cheesy, but I believe in it, is really to make our community and our city a real city to believe in, and I believe that. So I want to briefly talk about how this is going to affect Mission Waco with the seven million uh, that we are keeping as a part of this grant. First, it's going to provide the ability for Creekside Community Village and our Meyer Center, which is Mission Waco's sort of one-stop shop for the unhoused community, to host resiliency centers in the case of power failures because of inclement weather, 
It's also going to provide permeable, permeable parking and driving surfaces, as well as a number of other climate resilient elements out at Creekside Community Village. It will update HVAC, accessibility, energy efficient at the Meyer Center, which is a very old building and very expensive to renovate, um, but also at the Lighthouse, one of Mission Waco's transitional housing units. Next slide, Eric. Second, it's going to provide a number of e-vehicles, solar charging stations for multiple programs at Mission Waco. Uh, I want to highlight it's also going to provide a scholarship program for TSTC and the Solar Energy Technology Program, providing not just tuition assistance, but as well as uh, room and board and help with uh, applicants going through that process. It's also going to help uh, Mission Waco's Urban REAP program, which stands for Renewable Energy and Agriculture Project. Um, which is going to help improve community food waste collection, composting, gardening while offering paid internships and certifications in environmental fields such as composting as well. And here to talk a little bit more about what, this, what these funds are going to be doing with the Scrap Collective is our Director of Urban REAP at Mission Waco, Emily Hills. Hi, good afternoon, um, Mayor, City Council. It's uh, really exciting to be able to talk about this. Like they've said, this has been a long time coming. I know Eric said that we first got the Partners for Places grant in 2023, but we actually got a planning grant for that grant in 2022. So this has been about two and a half years coming. So I'm very excited to be able to talk to you guys about this. Um, as Eric mentioned, we had the Scrap Collective that we officially formally named this last year. Um, and through that collective, we were able to unite a bunch of different people around the city that do complementary things, um, all with the goal of trying to increase food security in our community. Um, and we were really focusing on two main components. One was gardening, but one is also composting, food, wa food waste diversion. How do we get that food waste out of the landfill and back into our soils so we can grow a, a healthier, greener community? And so we did that primarily through infrastructure. So we created compost site collect collection sites, but we also did a lot of education and outreach, right? It's one thing to have a compost bin. It's another one for people to actually use it. So we really wanted to complement the two and pair the gardening with the composting to make to kind of create that link for why composting matters, right? Without compost, without healthy soils, you don't have healthy food. And so this grant is really going to allow us to continue that work, um, but also expand upon it and build upon it. So Eric, if you want to um, do the next slide, that'd be great. Um, so um, I know John mentioned about the uh, about Urban Reap. We will continue doing composting and education, and I. Actually, go back one more. Let me let me speak a little bit about Urban Reap before I go into our partners. So we will be doing the community food waste collection, um, and then, like John said, we will be able to um, have paid internships. We have a really robust partnership with Baylor, which is great, but um, that's very self-selected because we can't necessarily pay them. So we're we're excited about the opportunity to be able to provide uh, financial opportunities for people who are interested in this work. And then we also have a composter certification course that um, this will this coming spring is the fourth year we'll be offering that, and that's meant to really create. Uh, uh, people who can spread the good news of composting. So trying to train people so that there's multiple people in the community who can do that work. Thank you, Eric. Um, World Hunger Relief has also been a pretty uh, substantial partner. They have a farm that can use all the compost and their goal is to alleviate hunger through sustainable agriculture, education and research. And so they um, have been able to produce compost that they then use to grow produce that they sell at a farmer's market, at our farmer's market. Um, and so they'll continue to do that work. They've also been a really great source for com commercial composting because they can handle that kind of load and so they'll be able to continue and expand that. Um, they'll also be able to bring back their internship. I don't know if you guys remember, they used to have an internship program that they had to suspend for a little bit, but they'll be able to bring it back, training people in um, climate smart agriculture techniques. And then kind of a newer thing is their um, prairie, Black, Ram, Black Land Prairie Restoration Project. They will be able to create a little pocket prairie, which will um, not only provide ecosystem services, but also be an education space for them to kind of speak about why there's value in that. Thank you, Eric. Um, family of Faith is another kind of staple in our community. I'm sure you guys have, if you have not spoken with Pastor Ruben, you have heard of him. He does many amazing things. They feed um, 800 families every week that go through their food pantry. So they do a lot of work and through scrap, they were able to grow and build a garden and then start um, with education on nutrition and gardening as well, right? So to increase 
that food sovereignty, right? Not just access to food, but knowledge of food. And so they'll be able to continue that, but they will be the third resilience hub. So John spoke about the resilience hubs at Meyer Center and out at Creekside. Family of Faith will be a third one, which is great because they already kind of are serving as one. Um, but they'll have that energy resilience built into their um, infrastructure and they'll be able to um, continue the work that they're doing. And then the, the last thing that they'll do is they have this amazing field that gets flooded. So they'll be able to um, work on that field to make sure that it doesn't flood and can be a space for the community to use as recreation. Thank you, Eric. Um, and then the other partner that is explicitly mentioned in this grant is Baylor University. They have been um, another really helpful partner in SCRAP um, because they have so many students and teachers and professors that they can connect us with. And so the main um, thing that they're trying to do is how can they connect what the students are doing at Baylor with the work in the community? How can they make that link stronger? And so they've already been connecting classes and student projects with um, people in the community who are doing this kind of work. Um, and so they'll, again, be able to strengthen that. They also have, um, <laughs> hold on, it'll come back to me. They have their Baylor Community Garden, which they were able to revive with the um, funds from Scrap. And that's been a really robust compost site, actually, for students and, and classes to be able to compost. So kind of bringing that sustainability culture to the campus. Um, and then this is uh, another really exciting a new thing that they're, they're able to do is um, the uh, Department of Education, and I, I want to thank Kevin McGill for showing up today as well, um, to actually create more support for teachers in schools and to, to do trainings on the value of gardening and composting in schools. Uh, to our teachers, as you guys know are always overworked so how can um, they provide more supports for these teachers um, to be able to do gardening and composting we were actually able to give ten thousand dollars to two, five different schools so each school got two thousand dollars to try and, and start gardens and composting on site so that's that's something we were able to do with um, the partners for places and we'll continue will that work will continue through this funding as well and then last but not least they will be doing a Mayborn Museum um, exhibit to kind of raise awareness about what we're doing. And my understanding is that is a student-led project. So the students will be the ones developing that. Thank you, Eric. Um, so that's kind of a summary of SCRAP and what we've done and where we're going with it. Um, obviously, there are a ton of grant metrics for this. So I tried to clump them into categories, um, composting, so how much we're collecting, how much we're producing, but also participation of houses, houses households, businesses, and restaurants, nonprofits, and schools. Um, this grant specifically talks a lot about green spaces and rainwater infrastructure, so supporting clean water, and so there is some metrics around that. And then if you want to go to the next one. Um, and then, of course, green energy. Um, community engagement is huge. That's a big part of this, is how will we engage the community, so we will be keeping track of that. And then finally, that training for that workforce development piece that's really fundamental to this grant. Thank you. Thanks, great presentation. Any questions of, of the group or comments? Thank you all uh, for this awesome presentation. Um, I, I, I did hear from Dr. Body relatively early this morning from, from Cairo, so uh, she was super excited about this presentation happening. Um, I'm also uh, uh, so super supportive of her work. She has, uh, you know, in her uh, working food insecurity. She has been an in integral part of our church's community garden at Oliver Chapel, and I know it's involved. Um, I think that this this manner and this this execution of this grant, which was a, a tremendous boon for our whole community, is pretty awesome. I have friends who are city managers that are applying in different cities for this grant. And they were like, who did y'all's grant? <laughs> and I said, well, it was, I said it was led by Mission Waco. And they were like, well, bless their hearts. Tell them that they have my utmost respect. <laughs> um, but moreover, I think that the collective work that you're doing and linking those particular partners within our community is going to be so expansive in how it does. I mean, like, just what... <laughs> I, the summit was, what, two weeks ago, last week? I don't know. Uh, but hearing about Pastor Ruben's mobile food pantry, I mean, the things that can happen and that can grow from this, the experiences of what, you know, even District 1 has, has received with its relationship with the shack and, 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 and women in agriculture and creating community gardens and all of those things are so important because it really offers us an opportunity to really go back to the basics. Uh, you know, I tell people all the time, my grandmother had a garden in, a, in the lot next to her house. It was not just a personal garden, it was a lot-sized garden, and it belonged to 
the neighborhood. <laughs> yes, she tended it. Well, we tended it. Um, but, you know, we weren't the only people who received the spoils from that. And that was important to her to make sure that who, whatever needs were, were, were there were met. And I think that this is an opportunity to continue to do that. But teach us because we've forgotten those basic things and to go back to creating an opportunity to be resilient in ourselves and do the things that the earth will provide for. Um, so I thank you all for stewarding that and, and making, closing the circle. Um, I think that the work with the health district will be incredibly important just on a macro level at what we can do to encourage better health for our community. And that is that can be done with our own hands. And, you know, and the opportunity to link that with the education so that the next generation will not forget what, how to take care of themselves and then they will be able to teach men how to fish. So I thank you for that work. I look forward to seeing um, how this grows over the next few years. Um, thank you for giving us some money. Appreciate you. Um, <laughs> and uh, I look forward to whatever we can do as a city to continue to make this grow in advance. Yeah, this is an awesome collaboration and just is a testament to kind of the, some of the health of the institutions of our community that uh, we can collaborate in this way so successfully. And so, yeah, the city has a long-standing we will accept your money policy and so we absolutely are grateful <laughs> for the nonprofits kind of returning it and as it turns out we actually need it in this budget cycle you know, so uh no but appreciate all your good work I appreciate i see uh, dean singletary back there school of social work I appreciate their collaboration uh, mission waco um eric appreciate your great work facilitating this as these i don't quite know what a statutory partner is, but I'm, I'm happy to be one here. And I think uh, it's awesome to come alongside y'all and, uh, and, and improve our community in so many different ways here. So appreciate the presentation and all the great work that y'all have been doing. Yeah, I uh, share those same sentiments. Um, <clears throat> I, I really love how the named partners in this grant uh, showcase the intersectionality of the need for uh, community health and resilience. Um, you see the, the different entities that are, are working hard uh, with this from our public health district uh, to um, the Family of Faith Worship Center, Baylor University, uh, World Hunger Relief, Mission Waco, I can go on. Um, it is, uh, there, there's not one solution for the, the, the big community health problems that we face uh, when we're looking for a more sustainable and resilient and healthy community. So I'm really excited um, to have you guys as the, the sort of lead on this. Um, one, because you know it protects us legally, but two, because we're able mm -hmm. to uh, partner and come alongside you uh, in the really good work and see a benefit from it. Um, and I love when, when money can be spent in Waco and, and there's a tangible benefit. So thank you for that. Um, I'll say that uh, Mission Waco, John, specifically you guys were uh, noted on the, the last agenda item too. So it, it is not lost on us that you're a very busy person. So thank you for making time to be here uh, this evening. Uh, and Emily, thank you for the work that you do uh, with Urban Reap. Um, between you guys and Deshack, I've got uh, all of my, uh, every spring uh, for, for the garden in the back of our house, I've had all of my plant and compost needs met and then some. So I uh, really appreciate the work you do as well as the educational piece there. Um, and it, really sincerely thrilled about this. You mentioned the uh, sort of timeline dating back a couple of years now. So it's really cool to see it come to fruition. I'll just like to commend you on securing the grant and for putting together a plan that's going to help the citizens of Waco tremendously. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, this is great. I had to, when I first saw this, I thought it was 1.79 million. I thought, man, that's a lot. I mean, how did they get 1.8 million dollars? And then 18 million. I mean, it's it's a it's a big uh, it's a big old chunk. Um, and they're all Fed funds. Also, there's no city matching or municipal matching or local matching. So. Uh, congratulations on just the perseverance of, of, of getting going after it and and congratulations on the on the win um, I love the teamwork I mean that you pulled seven groups together that are all kind of going the same direction and uh, and pulling together and making making sure everybody kind of had a piece in it and make, making sure it all fit uh, that that's very impressive uh, and then also um, uh, mr. Kaufman I appreciate it on behalf of the city 
it's always weird on these federal programs. We talked about it in the last one, but uh, we needed new flooring and new windows in some of our neighborhood homes. And you figure out a way to get a grant from the EPA to make that kind of wander all the way back to our, our neighborhood in Waco. So you never know how the federal grants work, but this one is, is working great. Um, and then John, I mean, what you're doing at Mission Waco is great. And this, and, and the whole Creekside community, um, uh, having really, this is bringing it to, to life. There's a lot of people working on it. And a lot of people are, are, are proud of the work you're doing there and having this grant sort of, I don't know if it gets us over the finish line, but it gets us much closer to the finish line. Uh, and uh, yeah, I appreciate your work on that. So this is great all the way around. Uh, uh, great work by all the people involved in it. 18 million, big number. Mayor, I, I hate to, to jump back in and not give you the last word, but as you were talking about that, it reminded me, um, I, I know I mentioned that John was featured in the last agenda item, but this, uh, Emily, you mentioned earlier uh, the, the need for food waste diversion ties into even the next agenda item, because if you're not aware, we recently had to uh, build a new landfill, uh, and those things don't last for forever, so really appreciative of, and I'm sure Cody, who's here now, is also really appreciative of uh, <laughs> the diversion efforts to keep things out of his neck of the woods. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Okay, now for the last session. And we have a segue here, too. We were talking about scrap here also, and we moved from scraps to the landfill, I think, Bradley. Nailed it. Right. Nailed it. We've got... Um, the spirit of Dale Fitzler right there. <laughs> right. Um, okay. Cody Patillo joining us, our Everything director of today. Solid Waste Services. Uh, Cody and, and folks... Uh, around City Hall and on his team have uh, been really busy. And you're going to see some of that imagery here in a moment on um, transitioning from our current landfill site, 948A, uh, and constructing a new landfill site, uh, what we're calling 2400, as well as a transfer station uh, to serve the community. Uh, Cody um, and the team just uh, I was mentioning this to a council member this week, um, have really made me proud in the way they've approached something that could have gone, and still I guess could go, really <laughs> poorly. But to date, uh, to not be wondering um, if we're gonna beat the timelines that we establish for ourselves is, I'm just very thankful. Uh, yeah. Because the political, issues that could have come with a, a full landfill at one site and one that's not ready to have trash delivered at another um, could get wildly complicated and expensive to resolve. And so I look forward to Cody's presentation and him speaking into where they are in the project. So, Cody? All right. Thank you, City Manager Ford. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, we're going to provide an update on the solid waste facilities. I'm Cody Patel, the Director of Solid Waste. All right, so we are gonna talk about the airspace capacity at the existing landfill, the progress for construction at, oh, sorry, the uh, construction progress at the new landfill and transfer station, as well as the operations at the transfer station. All right, so the next couple of slides are the information we've, we've shared in previous updates. Um, we have finished up the 2024 fiscal year for TCEQ, so those are actual numbers from 2018 to 2021. That's, so this is the annual tonnage coming into the existing landfill, uh, as a reminder. Uh, from 2018 to 2021, we were pretty steady and then had a big jump from 2021 to 2022 as Lacey Lakeview landfill started to reach capacity. And then um, they went through a permit modification to expand their facility. That permit was approved in February of 2024. So March of 2024, we saw a pretty significant reduction in the tons of waste coming to our landfill, about a 25 to 30% reduction. Um, so we finished the year at about at 318,000 tons. Uh, and for FY25, we're tracking to be around 300,000, maybe a little bit less uh, for tons coming into us, which is good whenever we're wanting to uh, extend the life of a landfill as we're building these new facilities. Uh, for this is the airspace capacity, uh, this is the annual, we do an annual airspace analysis and then starting in 2021, we did this twice a year to really dial in that fill date or that closure date. Uh, the box in the blue was from our previous update in May. Uh, so that the top line or the top row showing September of 2025, uh, that is when we were projecting the landfill to fill up. 
and as we got uh, new tonnage, projected tonnage coming in, as well as our compaction rates have gone up from investments in equipment as well as software, uh, GPS units. Uh, that The box in the red is the updated airspace analysis showing our closure to be in February of 2026. Um, so those are good stories. We're, we're getting less waste and we've extended the life. So we really not, don't have that concern uh, that Mr. Ford had mentioned where we'd run out of space before a new facility is open. And we'll get into some of that detail in a few slides. So for the new landfill, MSW 2400, here is the site overview. This is off of FM 939 in between Axtell and Mount Calm. Um, so we're going to go over the projects that make up the landfill. We'll start with the entrance road. Um, so first shout out to our comms team for going out here and getting some amazing footage that shows the progress that we've made throughout, um, throughout this entire construction process. So this is the entry road. It's 0.7 uh, miles of pavement that get us from the highway uh, through the scale house to the administrative and maintenance shop uh, out to all the way to the sector one. This work was performed by a local contractor, Knife River, uh, with a cost of $3.4 million, and this was completed in June of 2024. Uh, this project was actually uh, finished in about 60 to 65 percent of the allotted working days, so they, they, did, they worked pretty quickly. We were really excited about how quickly they did move. All right, and so here's the biggie. This is the first sale of the new landfill. It is a little over 20 acres. We had to move about 1.5 million uh, cubic yards of dirt. Uh, you can see the stockpiles to the left there uh, to get this, this cell open. Uh, and just, just for reference, the future cells are about 10 to 8 acres, uh, while this one's 20. Uh, th for the life of this cell, it, it should hold about 1.7 million yards of, uh, or sorry, 1.7 million tons of waste. So this project is under uh, contract with Hammond Excavation. They've done work at the existing landfill and they are really knocking this one out of the park. Uh, we're really excited to have them. They probably the best contractor I've ever personally worked with. Um, so this project is slated to finish in January of 2025. Perimeter fencing, this project is complete. So as part of our permit, we have to have a secure facility um, so with this project, we had to install 19,000 linear feet of fencing. Uh, this was finished in September. Our, our maintenance building project. So this is our maintenance shop. It's going to be a slab for our administrative offices, as well as our uh, citizens collection station. And hopefully nobody gets motion sickness on this one. It moves pretty fast. Um, but it's with HCS General Contractors, another local contractor. We are projected to finish about $3.5 million. Uh, for overall cost with a, a completion of March of 2025. Now, as we look into the schedule, one, one thing important to note here is um, even if we were to push opening our new facilities as quick as possible, this project doesn't have to be complete to open these facilities. Uh, there will be some improvements here. Our maintenance shop is going to be a little bit bigger, close to the same size, but uh, the bay doors are going to be modified to where we can fit all of our equipment in there. Right now, we can't fit all of our equipment in our shop, um, and then we'll have modular offices uh, we looked at that for cost savings. And then our citizens collection station is going to be a, a significant improvement from what we have at the existing landfill with paved, uh, with paved surfaces. And that will help us keep our uh, general public separate from the, the heavy traffic flow at the working face. And that will keep that operation just a little bit more safe. All right, moving into our scales, our entry scales. Uh, this, again, is going to be a significant improvement from what we have at the existing landfill. Uh, right now we have one inbound, one outbound scale. And so our wait or queue times are, are pretty lengthy during the uh, heavy traffic periods or if the weather is uh, in, in inclement. Uh, now this will be two inbound scales, one outbound with a bypass lane. So we'll be able to process our customers uh, a lot quicker and it will improve that customer experience whenever you visit our, our sites. So this project is slated to be finished in December of 2024 and uh, another local contractor with JH Contracting. For our uh, utilities, so we are getting power out to the property. Obviously, we're going to need that. Um, one thing to mention here is we've uh, went forward with getting three-phase power out to the site. Uh, right now, we really only need single phase, but in about three to five years, we'll have to install a landfill gas system. And that landfill gas system will require, require three phase. So rather than going in and having to pull out 
majority of that that uh, investment, we were, we're going ahead and go in with that three phase power to make sure we're set up for um, the future growth. And that is set to finish in December of 2024. So here's the schedule. Uh, there really is not much change from the May update. Uh, the, I'd say the biggest one and probably the most positive is that that red line going up and down. We've moved that out from July of 2025 to September of 2025. And if you remember the airspace capacity, we think we can make it to February. So we're still planning conservatively uh, and we're pushing forward with the construction aggressively. Uh, just trying to hit the same schedule we've shown in previous updates. The big thing here is finishing up the critical items like the sector one, the entry scales, so we can get to that TCEQ pre-opening inspection. So once we get there, that takes about 30 days. We've already opened dialogue with the TCEQ about the pre-opening inspection, and they're really excited about the facilities, both the landfill and the transfer station. Um, so we're ready, uh, trying to make that process as seamless as possible so we can cut that 30-day period down as much as possible. And then once we are ready to, and open to take waste, then we'll have to have that soft opening so we have select fill or a fluff layer. So we're making sure we protect that liner uh, and make sure that nothing penetrates or punctures that liner. All right, so this is how much it costs to build a landfill. $20.8 million. So this is a little bit increase from our May update with some change orders that rolled in um, through the process, but, but nothing crazy. This actually finished uh, under budget and within the funding that was uh, allotted for the uh, new landfill. Cody, was that to date or is that projected entire cost? That is projected to finish. Great, 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 great. All right, transfer station. This is the site view. This is off of University Parks, FM 3400. Um, so uh, U Parks Radial Road. It is on an old landfill, MSW 1039. Uh, that landfill stopped taking waste in the late 80s. This is probably my favorite video. Um, but so this is the big project with the transfer station. This is the actual facility. Uh, it's the entry road. It is the scales, the parking, um, the actual facility, all the pavement and the citizens collection station. And so here you can see that's an outgrade facility. So you can, you can really see what it's gonna look like once we get this thing operational. This is with Hammett Excavation, the same contractor that's doing our sector one. Uh, so initially that was a little scary for us internally. Uh, if they turned out to, to not be such a good contractor, we might not, we might be having a different conversation or maybe y'all are talking to somebody different, uh, but they're, they're, doing a, they're doing a great job. Like I said, I, probably the best contractor I've ever worked with in, in, in my career. Uh, so we're looking at finishing this project close to a $14 million price tag. That does include that early, pro, early finish incentive. Uh, so our contractor is expected to finish by January of 2025. And so that early finish incentive, if they finish before January 24th of 2025, they'll receive that full incentive. And we expect them to hit that target and we're doing the, everything we can to help them uh, hit that target. All right, so next couple of projects are uh, just some support projects for the facility. This is a sewer project. Um, it's tying into City of Waco sewer to make sure that we're getting any water, contaminated water is going to our central plant to be treated and disposed of properly. And this project is substantially complete. We're going through the punch list items and uh, just, well, this one will be knocked out pretty soon. So as part of the permit process, we had to do a traffic impact analysis and it was determined we needed to add a left turn lane in the southbound direction. So the opposite way of this, where this video is going. Um, so that's what this project is. Uh, it's under contract with TTG Utilities and we are projected to finish in January of 2025. All right, and this kind of the same story as the last schedule. Really the only major change is pushing out that closure date for the uh, existing landfill. And so the pre-opening inspection is not quite as intensive as a landfill pre-opening inspection. There's just not as many moving parts. Um, so, but, but again, we're, we've already started that dialogue. We're ready to get that process rolling. So for this, again, this, this has increased from our last update in May. Uh, the FM 3400 project had not bid, so we didn't have that included. And then we also had some, a few change orders. Um, so this project did go over budget, uh, but we were able to utilize funding or remaining funding from the new landfill project. And between the two, we we're gonna be able to cover all the costs between both projects. And this is also projected to the to finish line here. So if you take away that blue box 
and the waste hauler going direct to the landfill. That's what our current operations are. So our recycling haulers collecting, and waste haulers are collecting curbside. Recycling haulers are going to Sunbright, our MRF, uh, and the waste haulers are going straight to the landfill. Well, moving forward, the majority of our operation, waste operation, will go to the transfer station, and then transfer trucks will haul to the new landfill, while some of our operations will still direct haul to the new landfill, depending on what they have. Uh, C and D material, which we're pretty much trying to keep uh, construction and demolition material out of the transfer station, especially during the initial opening, and then uh, work with uh, our, our contractor to make see if we can um, broaden what we take. All right, so transfer station operation privatization. So this is a new conversation. We went out with the RFP to uh, for waste hauling services. So. so Stella Environmental was the top vendor. We went to contract negotiations, and during that process, they came up, came to us with a proposal to take over all of the waste handling duties at the transfer station. Uh, after we analyzed that proposal, it was, looked very advantageous for us to move forward with that. Um, so that is actually on the agenda today, resolution uh, 2024 for a contract to award um, the transfer station operations to Stella Environmental Services. So I hate to read off the slide, but uh, Cell Environmental Services, they are the leading uh, transfer station management in southern U.S. They are operating in 90, over 90 transfer stations, and they already load 70% of their waste. And I want to highlight that because it means they know what they're doing and they're good at what they do. So adding them to the solid waste operation in the city uh, as a partner is going to be a long-term benefit for us. So some some uh, positives for privatization. It's going to eliminate the need for additional FTEs. It's going to reduce our annual O&M budget and reduce the uh, future CIP request. Um, and then one thing to mention about the, the contract that's on the agenda for consideration today is um, uh, several months ago, we purchased heavy equipment preparing to run the transfer stop operation with internal staff with FTEs, right? Um, well, as we started working through this, that was a sticking point. How, what are we going to do with this equipment that we've purchased that's you know, already on site? And talking with Stella, they really liked what we bought. They want, that's exactly what they would have got. That's what they told us. So um, part of the contract is they're going to reimburse us the cost of that heavy equipment once we open up the transfer station. So we'll be able to take those funds and utilize them for uh, equipment replacement for, with solid waste in the future. So it would help us reduce our future CIP request. All right, so talk about some of the responsibilities. So city's responsibilities are going to be the scale house, taking care of all the transactions, processing all the customers, and then the litter abatement along the highway, um, which is already in a contract with Goodwill. So Goodwill has had a long-term partnership with the city of Waco to provide litter abatement services along Highway 84 for the existing landfill. And we have expanded that to uh, include the transfer station, the roads approaching the transfer station. We've also went out with a request for bids for litter abatement uh, along the roads approaching the new landfill. Uh, and so we'll be um, coming to the council for consideration to award that contract here in the near future. And that, those are requirements from our permit. And then for the new landfill, there are also um, requirements from some settlement agreements. So we want to make sure we're honoring those commitments. Next are the contractor responsibilities. So once they come in, they're gonna perform all the waste handling duties. That's everything beyond the scale house. They're gonna direct the traffic, spot all the customers, handle the traffic at the collection station, process waste, load the trucks, haul the waste to the new landfill, and then any other um, permit requirements that are uh, necessary on the facility. All right, so talk about the transition. This is, to me, this is, this is my favorite side. This is a good story here. This red box here at the top, this is more of a flow of how our facilities open. Uh, when, when is, what facilities open, when is it closed? Um, so as we go through, you can see the existing landfill um, is open. Then we open the soft opening for the new landfill transfer station all the way up until the existing landfill is closed. This gold line is the remaining airspace capacity at the existing landfill. So we get about 25,000 tons per month at the existing landfill. So as, as we're getting tons, we, rather than open as quickly as possible, so if we open as quickly as possible, 
that gold, that gold line is going to finish somewhere around 250,000 tons of airspace remaining at the, at the existing landfill, which I don't really just not a good business decision for us. Uh, we want to make sure we're really maximizing the airspace because there's some revenue that can be generated there, obviously, and the uh, operating expense is, is, is less at the existing landfill than it is going to be to operate two facilities. So well, what we're doing here is uh, pushing out the opening to September of 2025 for that soft opening for about six months and then fully transitioning to the new sites in March of 2026. And, and that's kind of a moving target because we, what we're going to do is watch the tons that are coming in and we want to land in this sweet spot, this landing zone of having 50,000 to 100,000 tons remaining at the existing landfill. Uh, there's two reasons for that. One is it's going to make our overall transition a lot less chaotic going from one site to the other if we're not running to zero, as well as it is a great contingency plan for any type of emergency event or storm event where there's a lot of debris that needs to get cleaned up quickly that we have some airspace remaining at the existing landfill that's nearby. Um, so this is a pretty significant shift from what we've talked about. It's, you know, rather than hurry up, are we gonna make it? Now it's, we're gonna make it, and now we can delay the opening to where it's advantageous for the city of Waco. All right, for summary, uh, construction costs are 20.8 uh, projected to the finish. Transfer station, that's for landfill. Transfer station, 15.8 projected to the finish. Our goal is still to finish all the critical infrastructure by January of 2025. But rather than hurry up and open, we want to strategically transition uh, to our new sites to make sure we're maximizing the airspace at our existing site. Wrapping up, I know I'm up here presenting face of solid waste, but we wouldn't be in this positive position if it wasn't for the team I get to be a part of. Um, they have really bought in and committed to this idea of best in class services while we're developing these state of the art facilities that are going to improve the quality of life for our residents for generations to come. So we're really excited about it and I'm thankful for the team I'm on. All right, so a little plug for our Polar Express. Here's our schedule. Uh, uh, unveiling at the first meeting in December and then the overall schedule and then just a plug for residents and customers. Download that Waco curbside app, check our website uh, for how you may be impacted during the holiday season with your collections. So with that, I'll take any questions or comments you may have. Any questions or comments for Mr. Patillo, I'll say I have the curbside app. It's great. I get a notification the night before every uh, every pickup is due, and it tells me which bins to take to the curb. Uh, so if you don't have it, you're right. You should get it. Uh, and uh, we moved. Uh, we're moving into a new house this week, and uh, had a bunch of stuff to put out on the curb at the house we're moving into. And I was able to uh, cross uh, cross plug here. Use the My Waco app uh, to submit a bulk waste pickup. Uh, and it was all taken on the next trash day. So got, got a couple apps out there. It's not too many. I know if you don't like having stuff on your phone, uh, it's just two apps really get you situated. Um, but Cody, I want to commend you, man. It, in first, uh, you know, in, in 2024, it is not my expectation that you would have flyover drone videos of projects that would be in the seven figures and not eight and above. Uh, so obviously the, the total cost is going to be near that 35 million, but, um, you know, as you went through each slide and you had like a drone video and I was looking at the I'm like, oh, that's only 3 million. That's only 1 million. The, the fence somehow was under a million dollars for 19,000 linear feet. That's crazy. Um, and, and so to be able to manage costs, uh, that well, and also get us, get us ahead of schedule to the point where we have, uh, an added cost benefit of utilizing the existing landfill um, for a longer amount of time. Uh, I really commend you and your team for the work that you guys have done and put in this to, to put the city in an advantageous position. Um, uh, there, there, were, there were no bones made about the fact that, uh, you know, Bradley asked uh, our different departments to <clears throat> look at their budgets and see where we could cut. Um, and I'm sure he really enjoyed uh, looking at this project and realizing that you guys had saved um, versus what, what where we could have been at this point, so much time and money. So uh, thank you for that. I'm sure the taxpayers and ratepayers thank you for that. Um, but yeah, you, you and your team, um, this has been a really awesome project to watch and, and to track because it's one of the ones that every time you come back, it's good news. Uh, and that's really rare in this work. So thank you for that. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Cody. Um, great presentation. I'm going to echo council member Ewing, or excuse me, Mayor Pro Tem Ewing's um, sentiments. And I'll only add that in the vein of sustainability, I appreciate the ability to recycle, reuse, and repurpose those trucks. 
because I know that <laughs> they um, that was a cost that you know just anticipating in in the work that we were going to do, but you know uh, apparently the, our good taste is is apparent and the company will will take those and allow us to do other things with that money. I know that this has not been an easy project for anyone in your department, including management that was leading it, and we appreciate all of the things that have been done to make this possible and um, <coughs> fiscally sound, so we appreciate those things. Um, I, I was going to ask a question, and then I realized with the privatization, it may not be our problem about um, any, like, Wi-Fi access or things that needed to be out there for customer service purposes, but I was like, if that's not our problem, that's not our problem. Well, still is our problem. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that operation won't really need Wi-Fi, but our scale house still will. So we're actually using utilizing Starlink at okay. both locations. We okay. worked with IT, um, and like it's rural, so I knew it wasn't something that would be yeah. readily available. So okay, great. Yeah, we looked at going with fiber, but the the cost was yeah. substantial, like 150k to the yeah. transfer station and like 400,000 to the, yeah. the new landfill. So um, we're going to partner with Starlink. Awesome, thank you. Well done. Um, managing and overseeing a project that's like a, rather complicated and is uh, ahead of schedule and on budget. That's uh, that's really impressive. I was curious, are there, um, other than normal construction delays, are there other potential obstacles that that could arise at this point? Uh, well, so for the, the landfill, not so much. 95% um, of the liner is in, so unless they went on strike or something, that would be, which is probably not very likely. Uh, transfer station, um, we're, we're pretty much wrapping that up. They're, they're kind of putting the finishing touches on that. So maybe if there were some significant weather delays that uh, prevented us from getting some pavement done, that would delay the, the, on the paving of the actual facility as well as that uh, road widening. Um, that, that could cause some delays, but where we're, even if we had some delays like that, where we're looking at with extending the life of the existing landfill, we feel really comfortable with we're gonna hit our finish date, even if, say, we, we hit missed our target with construction. Excellent. I You're just wanna thank you for the report. Uh, looks like we're heading in the right direction. But uh, I'm really excited about You can't hear my voice. Make sure we hit your whiskey. Uh, about the music bubbles and cheer. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing what your float looks like. Uh, I know the community will enjoy it, and uh, thank you for that. But thank you for all the work that you're doing, Cody. I appreciate that. I know, I know it's not easy, uh, and uh, I thank you. And District Two thanks you for. Thank you. Doing all the work that you're doing for our solid waste. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just add to the chorus of, of praise. Great presentation, amazing work, especially as uh, Councilmember Chase said, project management wise. I mean, this has been a long road from the first rollout of an expanded landfill. And this, I think, should give the public a lot of confidence and faith in kind of the honesty, the transparency, and the effectiveness of our city staff and our city departments in being able to accomplish the public's vision um, for this. So kudos, great job. Really appreciate the work of you and your team. Thank you. Yeah, Cody, nice presentation. Uh, just you, you've managed this whole process very well. I, I love hearing you because you, you're, you're still relatively young, right? I love hearing you say it's the best contractor I've ever seen here. Yeah, I, love that. I just love hearing that. The optimism is just exudes uh, the goodwill. So I, I, I love the way you manage the project. Uh, well, Cindy and I drove out to 2400 a couple of weeks ago. It looks good. I mean, and by looking good, I mean uh, you can't see you can't see it. You know, I, the, you can see the perimeter <laughs> fencing and the the pavement, and it just it, it it's well planned. And I think the community, the the region will feel good about uh, this uh, this. Uh, uh, landfill um, on the transfer station I like the outsourcing concept there I think it makes all kinds of sense to have that uh, in a, a professional third party's hand and so I think that's a great decision um, I like how you're how we're thinking about future operations in the in the chart there that shows uh, the resident facing uh, uh, service are, are still going to be city Waco people 
Um, and the, the people picking up the trash are going to be City Waco employees, just like they, they always have been. And, and I, I appreciate your pride in, in, in talking about best in class, because that's still going to be reaching the door. The door to door people are still going to be City Waco folks that are aspiring to that best in class standard that, that you um, show. Um, the excellent use of Gantt charts, mm -hmm. I love that. And the operations transition, that, that, that chart also, is, I, I like it too. I, it's, uh, it was uh, very good, the timeline of that. Um, and just the project management that's sort of reflected in that, that, that timeline and that view is, is great. Looking forward to the Polar Express too. That looks, this looks like, sounds like fun. The one question I have, and I don't have a lot of time here, but going back to 948A, is there, and we don't have to go into this deep, I'm sure we'll talk about it in the future, but the reclamation process there, um, and again, if it's just, we're still considering how that works, that's fine, but what, will that start like immediately, or what, I don't even know the TSEC requirements, or, or what happens on, on that? Yeah, so we've got CIP uh, coming up pretty soon to start the closure phase. So uh, closure phase will be in four phases, and it will happen over a course of several years um, for us to put the final cover on the existing landfill. And once we go into uh, finish that closure phase, then we go into post-closure, which is a 30-year period um, that we have to monitor the facility and take care of the facility. Great. Cody, fantastic presentation. Appreciate it. Any other questions? I've got one thing I want to say, and... Um, I don't usually like to step over council either, but it came to me as y'all were giving Cody a lot of kudos. We had a recent staff retreat and um, leadership training, and uh, there's some things that I think managers has to say sometimes. Mm -hmm. And what one of the things Cody did really well in this project, he defined his what really clearly. What is to get this landfill open in time before we're running out of space. But the how he accomplished it is really noteworthy because he brought people along and collaborated really well. And what he didn't show, he sent me a picture a couple weeks ago of his guys and gals that worked for him. He brought them in to have a lunch and he basically gave this whole presentation and talked about how their work mattered to the community and also the intricacies of what's going on and what's being managed. And so educating people along the way, showing them, bringing them along, and showing how their work mattered. Um, I'm just real proud of not only the where he's going to land on timeline and budget, but the how he's accomplishing it. And I think it sets a really good standard for uh, our leadership team mm -hmm. as we take on big things. Yeah. So Amen. thanks for letting me jump in there, Mayor. And that's all we've got today. Absolutely. Fantastic. Thanks again, Cody. Thank you, City Manager Ford. Um, the, we now come to the point of the meeting where we ask for requests for scheduling of future agenda items. Mm -hmm. Are there any requests for future agenda items? I don't have any requests for future agenda items, but as it is 5.06 p.m., who are watching us live from the internet have a little under two hours to go to any of the 46 polling places that are available in McLennan County to cast your vote on this election day. Uh, Bradley, I want to say something. We've had two parades and we've been in two floats. Mm. And I want to kudos to City Secretary and her staff. They have been doing an outstanding job for us. And I think we need to recognize that hard work that they went to. I know Aaron had a Good time busting those balloons. He was, <laughs> but he was actually helping uh, Michelle and he loved it. But thank you for all your hard work, Michelle. Your staff is outstanding. You stayed right there with us until we all left and the parade, the float went on to come back to City Hall. So I know you worked very, very hard. Your staff did too. And I just want to thank you for representing us and making those floats so enjoyable for us to be on and to walk alongside. So thank you for that. Amen. Thanks, Michelle. And, and your team, you do a great job with that, no doubt. Josh, Amen. did you have something? What? Yeah, a full, full echo of that. But also, I would say that Though Aaron wore a UT Longhorns <laughs> shirt <Indeed>. to <laughs> the Baylor 
our ending. homecoming parade. <laughs> He's still in our good graces. We still love him because apparently he won a bet with his friends. And yeah. so I, I respect the game, but you know, but well, his, his little... team members, uh, football team members, ch challenged him and told him because he always brags about. I want y'all to know this: the city council to his school, which is in Crawford. <laughs> he brags about us all the time. And so they said, well, and he told them he was gonna be in the parade and he was gonna be throwing out candy. So they challenged him, dared him to wear a UT t-shirt. So you don't dare, Aaron. He took them on. <laughs> he still so, did us a good job. So he did better than did wit, but hey, <laughs> no one, no one on the parade route said anything, oh, no. you know, offensive to him or negative to him because he was at the very front of the float just throwing those candies out everywhere and having a good time. As long as he was throwing candy, nobody had a problem with yeah. well, and, and they know that that's the crown prince of District 2 right there, you know? That's right, that's right. <laughs> right. But anyway, he had fun. That was, it was fun. Mayor, Mayor if I may, yep. um, Thank you guys so much for that. But I would also like to say a big thank you to Megan, Jonathan, oh, yeah. Graham, Anthony, who's our parade driver, our and driver, Trey yes. Busby for all the work that they do and the partnership they, they yes. do with us when we do those Fantastic parades. job, Michelle, oh, for everybody. Thank you so much for the hard work that y'all did for us because y'all made it fun for us to be on the float. And we've got another one coming up Monday and then, <laughs> and then Christmas. They keep coming. All right, uh, we will now recess the work session and reconvene regular session for executive session as read into the record by the city secretary <laughs> at 5.10 p.m. Given that the city council will go into an executive session in accordance with the following provisions, personnel, Texas Open Meetings Act, section 551.074, Nomination and appointment of individuals to the McLennan County Central Appraisal District Board of Directors. We are now in executive session.